Um, so we, we, as we drew to a close last week, I, I started to say a few things about the lectionary. And you, you may know something about this. You may know nothing about it. Um, but if you look in the LSB, uh, at the very front of the hymnal, you'll see that there are four lectionary options. Uh, let's see, this is on Roman numeral page 14, is where the, uh, is where the three-year lectionary begins. I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but I do think that when they printed the LSB, they put the three-year lectionary in front of the one-year lectionary for some reason. <laughs> Maybe it was because they wanted to have the privileged place as you turn into the hymnal. In any case, you'll see on page 14, uh, that is uh, Roman numeral 14, uh, three-year lectionary series A. And the question that uh, we started to address last week was, what are some of the differences, the character between the one-year lectionary and the three-year lectionary? Um, one characteristic difference is that the one-year lectionary, that is these arrangement of readings, uh, which we have at Blessed Sacrament, are much more, uh, let's say, time-tested and ancient. Uh, Inasmuch as I noted last week from David Kine's book, he says that the lectionary that we have in the Lutheran Church essentially comes to form in the way that we have it, with some exceptions, by the 8th century. So uh, prior to that, it seems to me, and I think uh, the pastor I mentioned last week, Reverend uh, Dr. Richard Stuckwish, who is the district president of the Indiana district, um, you know, seems to think that the, the way that the ancient church would have preached uh, through the sacred scriptures would have been more of a lex continua way. So you start in a book, and you have you know, readings through that book, and sermons on the same book. And I mentioned you know, the collected sermons of St. John Chrysostom as a representative figure in the East, as well as St. Augustine as the representative figure of the West. And they do both have fairly comprehensive sermons on a large majority of the books in the New Testament. Um, and so it does seem that there, there was some you know, more continual way that these texts were gone through as opposed to a set of lectionary readings as we have it. Um, by the 8th century, again, David Kind says that in the West, you have some solidity around the development of the church year calendar. Uh, it's not to say that there wasn't any kind of sense of a calendar in the ancient church. You have early disputes in the church on the date of Easter, for example. And this becomes uh, you know, a point of really kind of rigorous contention to the point where it's like, if you celebrate Easter on a different date, we shouldn't even be in communion with you. And I was reading through uh, the Venerable Bede's Life of St. Cuthbert, and Cuthbert was this English saint. And at the end of the life of St. Cuthbert, the, the Venerable Bede quotes Cuthbert as saying, avoid those who do not keep Easter on this particular day, right? So like there were, there were developed times where they began to observe uh, certain occasions, and this would have been, you know, an obvious imitation of what had gone before uh, under the Old Covenant, how you would have had various feasts that the Jews um, and the people of God observed throughout the year, right? Like the Feast of Booths or the Feast of Passover, etc., like this. Um, but so far as particular readings that uh, are assigned for every, every week, it seems to be at least in some way, a later development. Now, as it goes, you know, in terms of a lectionary and the, the helpful purpose of it in the present, uh, I think one of the things that a lectionary does, uh, or one of the ends that it serves, is that it helps congregations not to be subject to the soapboxes of their pastors. If I'm the guy who has to come up with the text every week, there might be a handful of issues that I have a particular ax to grind about, and I'll just keep subjecting my people to the same material, because I only want to talk about one thing or a handful of things. The lectionary, in its versatility in terms of the array of readings that it has, assuming that a pastor does what he ought, namely to preach on some text that has actually been read 
in the public gathering of the congregation, it, in a way, hems him in. Um, now, again, any pastor, I suppose, could just go off script. He could read the lectionary readings and just not even make reference to them in his sermon. But that wouldn't really accord with the way that these public readings were handled, right? We saw again from Nehemiah and from 1 Timothy and from Luke that there was a public reading of a particular portion of God's word and then the sense, not of some other word, but of the one that was read, was given. Uh, Jesus does this with Isaiah and the sense that you get from Paul's exhortation to Timothy is you devote yourself to the public reading of scripture then to teaching and exhortation on the basis of that which is read. So the lectionary uh, helps to keep the pastor um, focused on things in a broader way. As St. Paul says, we should make consideration of the whole counsel of God, right? I had a professor at the seminary. He's a good professor, Peter Scare, but he's very involved in, you know, the kind of social, the social realm, and he wants to fight a lot of those social battles, which is good. But it seemed like every class we had, we'd be, we'd, we'd find a way into the issue of abortion. And it's like, okay, well, we all know that that's important to consider, but, like, we're, we're going through the Gospel of Matthew right now. So, like, you know, can we, can we just kind of get out of that rut a little bit and, and stay on course with, with the class that we're in? So, uh, so, in any event, now, what is the thought behind how the lectionary is arranged? And here we have... Some similarities with the three-year and the one-year, and some dissimilarities. Both the one-year and the three-year preserve what we would call the festal portion of the church year. Do you know what I mean when I say that? What, what is the festal portion of the church year? Any idea? Or the feast portion? Yes. Okay. Advent to Easter? Yeah, pretty, pretty close. Advent to Holy Pentecost. Um, so we're still in the festal portion of the church year. Um, and what does the festal portion of the church year focus upon particularly? If you had to think about the character of these seasons, Advent and Christmas, Epiphany. The birth, left. death, and resurrection of Christ. Okay. So, teaching and... Right. Okay, so the festal portion of the church year has principally to do with the sort of arc of the life of the Son of God in his conception and birth, up to his death and his resurrection, um, and his ascension and the sending of the Holy Spirit. Uh, you also get the sense of the, his return for judgment, even in the season of Advent, but you also get the character of that uh, focus at the very end of the church year. So like the last several Sundays of the church year, focus upon the judgment, the return of Christ in judgment, and then that kind of gives way to the same sort of character in the season of Advent. We're not only anticipating the first coming of the Son of God in the flesh, but we're also focusing upon his return again in glory. So the festal portion of the church year calendar really has that as its emphasis. I mean, the whole lectionary is to be thought of, you know, if you were to think of a shape, in cruciform terms. Because we're always hearing the gospel. We're always hearing, there are very, very limited exceptions to this rule. Nearly in every case where the gospel is read in our midst, we're hearing the voice of Jesus. The exceptions to these are, you know, uh, certain occasions that focus upon, say, John the Baptist. Or before he's born, right, like if we're celebrating the nativity of our Lord, we're not hearing the voice of Jesus in the sense of, you know, his incarnate, mature voice that he's, where he's speaking throughout the gospels. We don't hear it in his presentation or the Annunciation uh, or his circumcision or whatever. Um, but the, the rule, generally speaking, is that the Gospel reading begins something like, Jesus said, or, and after three days Jesus traveled to such and such place, and he said, right? So it's cruciform in the sense that we're always focusing upon, and the church year calendar is always going in this pattern of Christ coming into the flesh in order to go to Jerusalem to suffer and die for our sins. And that's particularly taken care of in the period of time between Advent and Holy Pentecost. And then, once we get to Holy Trinity Sunday, which is also kind of a unique feast day, because most of our feast days are celebrating occasions in the life of our Lord Jesus, uh, or persons, like the Feast of St. John, the Beheading of St. John the Baptist, or the Feast of the Confession of St. Peter, or whatever. 
But the, the Feast of the Holy Trinity is, it sort of stands apart as a feast day that focuses particularly on a doctrine, namely the doctrine of God, right? Who is God? What is his nature? How does he reveal himself? Um, and then after, after Holy Trinity Sunday, then we go into the season of Trinity, right? So all the readings from that point forward until we get to the last Sunday of the church year are the first Sunday after Trinity, the second Sunday after Trinity. Um, the three-year lectionary is with the one-year lectionary in the first portion of the church year calendar, the festival year. Right? So it also focuses upon uh, these, these um, parts of the life of our Lord Jesus as we have them in the second article of the Creed. But then the character of the three-year lectionary is the Sundays following <coughs> that are in what we call ordinary time, are not called the Sundays after Trinity, but the Sundays after Pentecost. Um, and this, you know, th this is, I, I don't think for bad purposes, because... The, sun, the Sundays that follow after Holy Trinity are sometimes called the, the time of the church. The festal period is the time of Christ, again, where you're hearing of his life. The ordinary time is the time of the church, where the focus is on particular, at least in the case of the one year, particular doctrines. So the theme of the Sundays throughout the church year and the one year lectionary, especially in ordinary time, are meant to be catechetical in nature. So I think the first Sunday of Trinity is always, the hymn of the day is always, by grace I am saved, and the gospel reading is always the parable of the workers of the vineyard, who are called at various hours of the day, all the way up to the 11th hour, and then at the end, much to the chagrin of the guys who bore the heat of the day, everyone gets paid the same amount, right? So the emphasis of that Sunday is on the grace of God in inviting uh, right, the, the people to come and work in the vineyard and then pay them an equal wage. Uh, and so that's really kind of the, the way that the one-year lectionary proceeds is doctrinally. So the gospel reading has some focus on a particular doctrine, and then the Old Testament reading and the epistle are selected on the basis of whatever the focus of the gospel reading is. In the one-year lectionary, or the three-year lectionary, you get this focus on a kind of continual reading through the gospel. It's not to say that you couldn't cover doctrines in the three-year lectionary, but the character of it is a little bit different. Um, so, you'll, you know, like if you're in series A, you're going through the gospel of Matthew. Uh, if you're in series B, the gospel of Luke, or Mark, the, series C, the gospel of Luke, and then John sort of spattered throughout. But it's it has this kind of character where you're, for the most part, going through the Gospels in a relatively chronological way. Um, and in the case of the three-year lectionary, you have sort of a continual reading of the Gospel, at least chronologically speaking, and then the Old Testament reading is selected based on the theme of whatever the Gospel is. But then an epistle reading has really nothing to do, in many instances, with the Gospel or the Old Testament because they wanted to focus on continual readings uh, in, um, in, the case of the, uh, in the case of the epistle. So like if you look at pages 14 and 15 uh, with the Roman numerals, you'll see that uh, during the festal portion of the, the church year, that is from Advent 1 uh, up to Holy Trinity, you don't necessarily have a chron chronological reading and that's where you get spatterings from other Gospels. Some readings from John, some readings from Luke, even in series A, right? But then, once you get down to uh, where it says proper three on Roman numeral 15, that's the first Sunday after Trinity, and you're into the ordinary time, then you can see that Matthew proceeds fairly chronologically. So the, for, for the reading for proper three, Matthew 6, 24 to 34, the next week, Matthew 7. The next week, Matthew 9, a portion of Matthew 9. The next week, another portion of Matthew 9 and Matthew 10. Then Matthew 10, Matthew 10, Matthew 11, Matthew 13. So they don't capture every single chapter, but it's proceeding more in that kind of uh, chronological way through, uh, through the Gospel of Matthew. Whereas if you look at the one-year lectionary, and this would be on page 20 and 21, 
when you get to the season of Holy Trinity, uh, the, the Sundays after Trinity, it's like the first week is Luke 16, the second week is Luke 14, the third week is Luke 15, so we appear to be you know, working in some kind of order, but then Luke 6, Luke 5, Matthew 5, Mark 8, M Matthew 7, Luke 16 again, Luke 19, Luke 8, so it doesn't have the same kind of character of going through in a, in a continual way uh, the gospel. So this, the three-year series was, I think, meant to be an attempt to sort of recapture this character of the, the way that the early church would have proceeded in its preaching. And the one-year lectionary has as its focus uh, themes, particularly various doctrines or dogmas that should be propagated and taught at all times in the church. Um, any thoughts or comments on the, just the distinctions there? Or okay, um, the the thing that I find less attractive about the three-year uh, lectionary is that it it's relative novelty, right? And as much as Lutherans don't want to have their you know their trailer hitched. To the Roman Catholic Church, we kind of followed in step with the Roman Catholic Church because they developed this other lectionary at the time of Vatican II. Um, and so some honorary Lutheran pastors who only will do the one year say, I'm not following the Pope's lectionary. And then everyone says, yeah, well, you're following an older Pope's lectionary <laughs> because it was developed by an earlier Pope, but perhaps just not as bad a one as they had in the 20th century or whatever. But, um, so one of the reasons why I don't, I don't prefer it is the aspect of novelty. So in terms of my life as a pastor, I have a bunch of resources from pastors you know, going back to the time of the Reformation and even earlier, who are preaching on essentially the lectionary that we're using at Blessed Sacrament. So it's, it's helpful in that way to say, well, look at all these guys. They preached on these texts. This is the manner in which they preached on them. Uh, I can look at a, you know, a collection of Luther's sermons, and he has apostles oftentimes on the epistles and the gospels for every week in the one-year lectionary. That's enormously helpful, right? And it has a more continuous character. But the thing that really rubs me the wrong way about the three year, at least the way that I had the impression at the time I was at seminary, is it, it, you'll have to kind of go with me a little bit on this, but the three year lectionary seems to have as one motive behind it a subtle undermining of what we call the unity of scripture. And by the unity of scripture, what we mean to mark out by that expression is that the, the entirety of the Word of God is inspired by the Holy Spirit from Genesis to Revelation. And the authorial intent of what is contained in the Old Testament and the New Testament is the intention of one, namely of God. But there has crept into the church uh, a subtle uh, idea that wants to make the authorial attention of any given book in the Bible the intention not only of the Holy Spirit, but also of the earthly author. So Luke might have had his own ideas that he was trying to develop under the subtle inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Um, and so it's kind of a combination of Luke's ideas and the way in which the Holy Spirit inspired Luke to write. Uh, Francis Pieper, who was a student of C.F.W. Walther, says in his Dogmatic Theology, we should in no way speak of Johannine theology, Pauline theology, Petrine theology. In other words, we shouldn't say, well, this is the theology of John, and this is the theology of Paul, and this is the theology of Peter or James, whoever else, because the theology of the sacred scripture is that which comes from God. And so the unity of scripture has in mind that the entirety of this book has a character that is unified together, intended by the Holy Spirit, and the interpretive, uh, let's say, the interpretive approach that we have to the sacred scripture is that the books are taken together and each one interpreting the other. But we've, we've kind of come into, uh, I would say, a novel way of approaching some of the Bible especially those portions that record histories, even in the case of the Gospels, and that, that approach is called the narrative approach to the Scripture. And the narrative approach to the Scripture will say things like, 
the scripture uh, may be more than literature, but it's certainly not less than literature. And oftentimes, uh, even professors and theologians who are advocates for the narrative critical approach to the Bible will say things like, well, the Gospel of John has its own character. It has its own internal narrative arc. And the best way to understand the Gospel of John is to see all of the subtle ways that John, as a narrative writer, develops particular themes distinct from Matthew or Luke or Mark. Um, and so what this ends up uh, turning into practically when you're interpreting the book of the Bible is you kind of isolate these books away from each other. And you say, the best way to understand the Gospel of Matthew is simply by reading the Gospel of Matthew and not letting other influences or other books in the Bible to, let's say, help you to come to certain conclusions based on that which you're reading in the Gospel of Matthew. Um, I mean, th th this occurs to such an extent that I have heard exegetes in our own Missouri Synod say things like, and this is what turned me off to the three year when I was at seminary, say things like, if you're preaching through series A, which is mostly focused on the Gospel of Matthew, do not pull from Luke or Mark or whatever, because you're focusing on Matthew. You'll be able to preach on Mark next year, right? <laughs> so just focus on Matthew. And it's like, well, there are some details that Matthew doesn't have. <laughs> so what do you think of that? Okay, so I remember I was at this pastor's conference, and one of our, uh, one of our clergymen in the Missouri Synod, who has worked extensively in the Gospel of Matthew, had asked this question, why is it the case that St. Peter repents after he denies Jesus, but Judas doesn't repent when he betrays him and ends up killing himself? And I said, well, Jesus tells Peter that when you, when you return, strengthen your brethren. So he gives him this promise that, yes, indeed, you will deny me three times, and the devil is seeking to sift you as wheat, but you will return, and when you do, strengthen your brethren. So there's a promise to which uh, St. Peter inclines faith, grasps hold, right? And so his repentance doesn't just have the one part of sorrow for sin associated with it. Whereas Judas, that's all he had was sorrow, right? And a, and a worldly grief, which then led him to, to kill himself, right? Um, but Peter has a promise to which he grabs hold. And so he's not only sorrowful, he not only goes out and weeps, but he also returns because he grasps hold of the promise that Jesus speaks. Well, what's the problem? He says that in the Gospel of Luke. <laughs> so that was the answer. Well, that's in Luke. That's not in Matthew. And it's like, well, it is in Matthew. He just didn't write about it. Meaning, it's not as though Matthew is recording some different thing. <laughs> He's recording the same thing that Luke records, but there's a detail in Luke that is missing in Matthew. But it's not like it didn't happen. And the reason why I know it happened, because it's in the Gospel of Luke. <laughs> now, maybe if pressed a little further, I wouldn't have walked away with the impression like, well, I guess this guy doesn't think that we should be interpreting Matthew by other books of the Bible or other Gospels. But it starts to sort of come across that way. So there is this kind of subtlety with the three-year lectionary that, that carries along with it this attitude uh, in interpreting the Bible that, let's say, subtly or maybe not so subtly undermines the unity of scripture in a way that I do not recognize happens in the one-year lectionary. Because the one-year lectionary is, in the case of the gospel readings, is such a spattering of gospel readings that if you don't pull from Luke's account of the same thing that Matthew, you get read in the, in the church from Matthew, then you just never consider it, right? So the one-year lectionary supports, it seems to me, the preservation of the unity of scripture because, because I have to pull from the other gospel readings in the case where there is a parallel account to give a, you know, to fill the picture out, right? And so, so that's one issue that I have with the three-year. I don't say that like everyone who promotes the three-year has that view, but I do know that that view attends very many people who advocate for the three-year. Now, I wanna say one more thing by qualification. It's obviously true that the Gospel of John has a certain character that the Gospel of Matthew does not have. And likewise also with Mark and Luke. 
Mark's gospel is clearly much shorter than the other three. <laughs> and John's is so much different than the synoptics of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Um, it is true that the way that St. John writes is much simpler than the way that St. Luke writes. Uh, right? um, and there are uh, expressions, let's say, that are characteristic in the Gospel of John that are not as frequent in the other accounts. Um, but what we say about this with regard to the doctrine of verbal inspiration is that the Holy Spirit uh, condescends to his amanuensis. The amanuensis is the guy, the instrument that the Holy Spirit is using to write his gospel. He condescends to his amanuensis, and he uses those qualities that avail in a particular person in order to record what the Holy Spirit desires to be written. So that we shouldn't have some idea that John had some story that he was trying to string together. Right? <laughs> Again, I've read in uh, clergymen from our own Missouri Synod, things like, okay, uh, St. <clears throat> Luke, like a master storyteller, is kind of weaving all of these themes in. It's like, well, either the Holy Spirit did that or he didn't. I, I don't want to have it in my mind that St. Luke has some <laughs> alternative agenda uh, that he's, he's sort of subconsciously stringing some narrative together that the Holy Spirit does not intend. And I think that, uh, you know, that, that way of reading the scripture can be off-putting, especially to the average person in the pew. Because some of the narrative critical exegetes will say things like, if you don't pick up on these subtleties, if you don't, if you don't recognize the unique vocabulary of John, if you don't recognize or acknowledge this particular characteristic of the narrative arc of the Gospel of Luke, you don't get it. <laughs> it's like, well, you seem to be the one who came up with this, so a bunch of people must not have got it before you. <laughs> which is kind of a dangerous, uh, which is a dangerous presupposition. So, uh, and when I read Luther, it's not that Luther doesn't have colorful ways of interpreting the Bible, much like the Holy Fathers of the Church, in the way of allegory and typology, right? Um, but this narrative critical approach, I think, when they say the scriptures might not be, uh, might be more than literature, but they're not less, it often turns to, out to be the case to me that they're treating the scripture as though it were just simply like literature. And it's not. I mean, it does have literary qualities, to be sure. I'm not saying that. Um, but it's not, it's not merely literature, um, where we're trying to get into the mind of, of Luke and say, well, why did he do this, or John, and why did he do that? It's like, the words say what they say. And the Lutheran, uh, the Lutheran impulse is to stick with the simplicity of the text, and then interpret it in light of the other passages in the sacred scripture particularly. So, um, so that, that, that's one of my concerns with the three year, is that it, it just has this sort of subtle character, like we're only gonna focus on this one gospel, um, and you sort of separate it off in a way. Um, I mean, even in the case of the Church Fathers, if you read St. John Chrysostom's sermons on Matthew or St. Augustine's sermons on John, I mean, they're, they're constantly pulling, right, from other, it's not, it's, they don't have a sense that these books have a disunited character and they should all be interpreted in isolation from each other. And maybe if pressed to give them credit, the people who advance this kind of narrative critical approach to the interpretation of the Bible would agree, at least in verbiage, with the unity of Scripture. But often in practice, it doesn't. It just seems to be a subtle undermining of it. So um, that's been kind of an axe I've had to grind since I was at the seminary. So forgive me for going on and on about that. Um, and if you have any questions or you want to talk about it another time, we can, we can certainly do that too. But this would be the reason why I would prefer the, the one year to the three year, is that I although it doesn't have continual readings, like again, if you go back to series A, you can see that in the season immediately following Trinity, which is called uh, the season of Pentecost in the three year, you read fairly comprehensively through the book of Romans. You don't get, you don't get every last chapter, you don't get every last verse, but you read fairly comprehensively through the book of Romans. There is no part of the one year lectionary where that happens where you have a, a continual reading through this or that book. 
but what you do have is a more unified character between the three readings, right? That they that they all have you know some uh, some touch point in the other, um, and that you know I think is helpful, right? Because this is the manner in which we should read the scripture. I, I come to a concept in this book of the Bible that I'm totally confused about and I don't know anything about, and so what else does the Word of God have to say about this? Where do I go in order to fill out my understanding and so forth? Okay, any thoughts or comments there on lectionary stuff? Yes, David? One of the other things you mentioned, you might have mentioned that, uh, is this about a teacher? Because mm -hmm. you repeat it more often. Mm -hmm. Instead of every three years hearing about a particular passage, you hear it every year. Right. Maybe your particular take on it that's different, but, uh, but it's, more, it's more repetitive. Right, right. And that that helps to learn it better, I think. Yes. Um, so that's another, I guess, practical man. Right, right. And that's, you know, obviously that takes a lifetime. You know, I mean, I'm. Th this is the first place that I've been where I started using the one-year lectionary. So I'm looking forward to the time where I can, like, know, oh, yeah, it's the such Sunday after Trinity, and I know what the propers are. That's a good thing. Um, it's... You know, so people, the, some criticizers of the one-year lectionary say it doesn't have enough Bible in it or something. Um, and you know, I mean, I I understand I understand the criticism or the critique or whatever. But again, the focus of the one-year lectionary really is um, a focus upon dogma, which is you know a help and an aid to reading the rest of the Bible. Um, but this point about repetition, I mean, this is the same reason for which I think it's good to just simply use one divine service setting. Um, I think I quoted this passage to you, David, a couple days ago from Philippians, where Paul says, for me to write the same things to you is no problem, and for you it is safe. There is a, there is a security in repetition. And um, like August, or Athanasius in, on the incarnation of the Word of God says, I would rather be accused of repetition than, you know, having glossed over something and never addressed it. So forgive me if I keep, yeah, go ahead. What prevents the Senate or any other organization from creating a, another lectionary that takes the best of both? What prevents them from doing that? Right. Why are we, why, why be... Saner minds. I mean, I mean, just the two. I mean, if, if yeah. reading through a particular passage is, is, is beneficial, like you, like you said, but the one year it doesn't really touch on Romans very much. But mm -hmm. There are things in Romans that are very nice to hear and critical to hear. Why not have a blended lectionary? Well, what stops this? Is it just. Uh, From. Well, are, are there alternative lectionaries that are available? Well, not, not ones, to my knowledge, that have actually been approved by our Senate, right? You might have. You might have some other ones that we don't have, let's say, present to our hymnals or to our agendas. Um, are you are you saying maybe we ought to do that? No, no, no. Okay. What what stops it? What why why just the two? I mean, if, is it is it just that, does it have to be like a global vote or something? Does it have to be? <laughs> no, you know, I, 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 I yeah, I mean, church I, council like the you know something really monumental to do it. Yeah, well, I I think these things are developed in convention. Right? So it could be that you have some kind of synodical resolution that says, um, you know, we encourage the Missouri Synod to create a committee to investigate the creation of a new lectionary or a new hymnal or whatever. And then that, that sets them on a trajectory or a process of putting liturgical heads together and studying the issue and then coming uh, coming to some decision regarding either the development of a new lectionary or not, or the development of, of a new hymnal or not. So, you know, it, it's not it's not something I imagine that can just come about all of a sudden, right? It's going to take time. I I would just simply say they shouldn't. They what we have now is enough. Like Luther's commendation when he's talking about catechesis is, you you get one translation of the catechism and you stick with it your whole life because it aids in memorization to have the same text in front of you. If you're constantly updating translations, like we've done in the Missouri Synod, or at least we went from whatever, some translation from the 1940s to now the one for 1984, if you keep updating the translations, 
because you're concerned that the young whippersnappers aren't going to understand some word in the, in the king's English or whatever, uh, then you're actually going to create this separation between one generation of Lutherans and the next. When I was in catechetics at the seminary, my professor, John Pless, had memorized you know, the catechism of yesteryear, and so when we're memorizing it together as a class and he's doing it with us, he keeps falling into these ruts even though we're all in this updated edition. So my, my admonition or encouragement to the synod would be, don't do that, because you're just creating a multiplication of things. But I think perhaps you know, there was a desire to offer some amount of variety to people who, who just simply were fed up or did not understand the value of repetition. So we can't, you know, we can't just have one divine service setting or we can't just have one lectionary. We must have multiple options so that we have musical variety and maybe that will you know, scratch the itch of people who are sick of TLH page 5 and 15. And I think that that you know, has erupted into an importing of so much variety in the Missouri <laughs> As we were talking about before, for Academy, you might never find another congregation that looks quite like your own, you know, depending on the area of the country that you live in. And so that kind of creates a disunity. So I think one lectionary would be helpful as an external, like we don't have, to, it's not like by divine right, you know. It's not like the lectionary fell out of heaven. I would say, like the other rites and orders and ceremonies, we submit ourselves to these things in a spirit of humility because it's good to have, it's good to have a united front when it comes to praxis. Because um, it helps the weak. It helps the laity. I was telling the Pattersons when I was in Montana, I had an elder who shortly after I arrived died of severe cancer. And he was going through treatment in Arizona. And he had to go to like three or four different churches before he actually found one that used the hymnal and was just like a normal Lutheran church. Here the guy is dying and he can't find a place that feels like home, you know. So, so why, why we don't do it, uh, I mean, I'm glad we don't. I wish there were more, in this case, roadblocks and bureaucratic red tape that would prevent the multiplication of these things because I just don't find it to be helpful. Um, so for now, you know, we have um, the, the three year and the one year. I know at the seminary, I mean, they're, they're, they push pretty hard for advocating for the three year as opposed to the one year. And then a lot of younger pastors prefer the one year to the three year. I don't know if that's a rebellion. <laughs> yeah, one of the other advantages of this, you can go back, like you said, and read Lucas' sit, hit, uh, sermon right. on that day for that, for that uh, reading. Right. Or in box cantatas or all on the one year of You can go back and listen to those. So that's, it's really, I, I really prefer right. R in one year. Yeah. That, that, that matters. Because uh, it ties into the, the history of the church. And you can go back and read these guys in context right. on the day that this compiler is playing. Yeah, and in the case of Luther's sermons, if there are certain cases where you'll have like a sermon on the same text from 1530, 31, 32, and you read the sermons and they're nearly indistinguishable. They all sound the same. And you think, well, not only were the readings the same, but Luther focused on the same thing year over year over year over year for this purpose of... Yeah, right. Because we suffer from spiritual amnesia. I mean, how many things we forget. So, okay, we're at the end of our time, I think. So any other last comments or questions? Thoughts? Two silly things. There's yes. a Millennial Bible and a Queen James Bible. If you're ever interested. Thank you, Matt. <laughs> Hopefully we I will not assume we're not adopt any of those translations. Uh, for the, maybe the ELCA will uh, <laughs> prefer one or the other of those. All right, well, let's close with prayer, and then uh, and we'll proceed to the divine service. The Lord be with you. With your spirit. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Most merciful God, Heavenly Father, and the Holy Gospel, appointed for Jubilate Sunday, we hear our Lord Jesus Christ uh, encourage the apostles uh, that they will have joy, uh, but he also sobers them uh, by warning that they will likewise have weeping and lamentation. We ask that even as we uh, celebrate continually the season of our Lord's resurrection, 
uh, you would help us uh, to recognize that we yet remain in the world uh, and under the attacks of the devil in our own flesh, uh, so that even as we rejoice in uh, the promise of the gospel, we are nevertheless always constantly under attack uh, and in need of being watchful. So grant to us repentant hearts and minds that we would incline our ears to the preaching uh, and the reading of your holy word, and that we would be strengthened by your son's body and blood in the holy communion. All these things we ask for the sake of the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen.